Uh, so when we're talking about Klondike Solitaire, um, I'm just talking about your run-of-the-mill, most people just call it Solitaire, Windows Solitaire. It's appeared on every major distribution of Windows since I believe 3.1. Um, 52 standard cards, you deal out seven, seven, uh, seven stacks to the table. Uh, 21 of those cards are face down, and 7 are face up. You've got the vault. I'm assuming most of you have played this. I don't need to go into the problem description um, uh, too deeply. The point is to get all 52 cards um, up into these four foundation stacks at the top. Um, it actually turns out to be a very hard problem. Um, for those of you who know well, uh, for me personally, it's a very frustrating game. I can never keep my score above zero, which is actually the point uh, when you play. Um, some quotes, some interesting quotes that we've had in the last few years on solitaire. This is a paper, uh, it was in NIPS in 2004, um, in which Robbie Yang did some work on variants of solitaire that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it says, there's one of the embarrassments of applied mathematics that we cannot determine the odds of winning a common game in solitaire. Now, one of the co-authors on this paper was a, a, a mathematician statistician uh, out of Stanford, Paris and Diakonis, and he's actually done a lot of work with uh, the theory of shuffling cards and knows what he's talking about. This is a pretty heavy statement here. Um, another statement that he gave, uh, um, he gave a talk at the University of Washington in 1999, you can go online and find it, I believe it's referenced in the paper. Um, he said in this talk, I promise you that if you can find a computer program that plays solitaire anything like the way real people do, I'll get you on the front page of the New York Times. People are actually interested. As opposed to most of over here. Uh, <laughs> and so these are two pretty heavy statements. And there really hasn't been a lot of, of work done in Klondike Solitaire itself. There's a variant of Klondike Solitaire. Um, this Ravi Yan paper uh, in 2005 um, worked on uh, called Thoughtful Solitaire. This actually um, appeared uh, in last year's planning competition. Um, and so it's in every way exactly like Klondike Solitaire, except for that you get to see where these 21 hidden cards are. Um, and so we've tried, taken this the probabilistic problem and turned it into a deterministic problem. And so now we can apply all of the great um, classical planners to it and you know, apply it to uh, the planning problems. All the standard Klondike rules apply, and the implication of that is if you find a win in, um, in thoughtful solitaire, it implies that there exists a win in Klondike. You might not be able to find it because you don't get to see where the, the 21 cards are. You have to guess. But the win is there. And so that's kind of, this is the start of where we're doing research in, um, in, in uh, we're heading toward doing research in Klondike. And in this paper that they presented in 2005, they were able to demonstrate a policy that won 70% of their games. Um, they also cited some work saying that um, if you use certain template patterns, um, you can show that 1.19% of games are completely unplayable. You can't move any cards at all. Um, so those games are lost. And so they're roughly accounting for about 71% of games um, leaving about 29% uncounted for. We took this as a starting point. Um, we published a paper uh, a few years ago um, where we, is still in Thoughtful, um, did a variant of their uh, of, of nested rollout algorithm. Um, we, we added some dead end detection by solving the last plan of the game. Uh, we, we used this macro to see that we no longer have this, this one deck where you turn three cards at a time. Uh, we implemented a macro where if you could reach a card in the deck, um, that you just got to play that, and you have to follow the same rules. So if you play this, if you play this eight of clubs right out of the middle, that's going to affect where everything else gets played. But we haven't changed any of the fundamental rules. We just kind of improved um, the search space. The results that we got were uh, we were able to show a policy that with maybe two percent of games, um, and with this relaxed plan, with that end detection, uh, to show that nine and a half games, nine and a half percent of games are lost. So we've taken the, the uncounted games down to under ten percent. So this is work we've already done. This is kind of a build up. Um, to what done. So what do we know about Thoughtful versus Klondike? For Thoughtful, um, we, we know that there's an algorithm out there that can win 82% of games. Um, what do we know about Klondike? Well, you know, we really can't, as we, as we start work on Klondike, we can't expect to do as well in the probabilistic problem. We don't get to see where the cards are. Um, what we're really interested in in this research, in this paper, is, is, is kind of just taking the first step and saying, what, what can we say about the bounds of, of an optimal policy in Klondike? Um, just make any guesses at all. And I really spent a lot of time just scouring um, this great thing called the internet where you would expect all the information to be about anyone that could say anything about Klondike. Just some random guy that says, hey, I've played a thousand games. This is how many I've won. Hey, I wrote this really stupid program um, that won X percent. And um, 
really there was just nothing out there at all. Um, just nothing, which uh, utterly surprised me. Uh, so we came up with some heuristics of our own. Um, uh, in this talk that Parasidiakonis gave in, uh, in, in, two, in 1989, he made an estimate that around 15% of games uh, the humans win. Um, I went, there was this um, worldofsolitaire.com, um, it has thousands of games that people blog, and it, it, it kind of has about 7% of games won, but those kind of count games where people go back and undo moves they've made, and also counts games where um, maybe you know, people log on and then they log off in the middle of the game and they quit. So it's really not too reliable, but we're guessing that humans can play somewhere between 7 and 15%. Um, the other baseline that we assumed was kind of this Las Vegas scoring, where if you play Windows Solitaire, you can select Las Vegas scoring, and that means that uh, you pay a dollar for each card at the beginning of the game, you pay $52, and for each game you can put back up into the foundation, um, you get $5 back. So if you can win 20% of games, you break even. Right? So this is kind of the upper bound of where we're expecting to be able to perform. We figured, you know, if, if this is good enough for Vegas, it's good enough for us. Um, um, on that note, uh, all indications are that Solitaire isn't played in Vegas anymore. It used to be um, no references on it. Um, but this was kind of what we guessed. And then we kind of did some of our own, where we set up using some of these improvements that we had done uh, in Thoughtful. We uh, just implemented random play, and we could win about 7% of games. Um, and then we classified all, play from, uh, all of our different actions. Um, some actions are inherently better than others. For example, an action that moves a card up into the foundation is better than an action that will just move uh, a card around the table. So we classified them all, we prioritized them. If you follow these priorities, uh, you can win about 13% 13 13 of games. And so this gels well with kind of what our estimates of human play are and um, significantly below what our expectations of Las Vegas are. So we're, we're in the same ballpark. And so as we, as we talk about defining Klondike as a, as a probabilistic planning, planning problem, um, it's important to remember that there's only really one class of probabilistic uh, of moves here. There are actually quite a few deterministic actions as you move cards from one place to another. But we have these 21 cards that are initially face down. And uh, we don't know what they are. Uh, when you uncover a card, um, you, you get to find out what the result is. Um, in reality, as you play, this is more accurately modeled as a, um, a partially observable uh, problem where the value of the card is actually fixed before you, you change it. Um, but we can easily, you know, easily model um, as, a, as this hidden state or uh, any type of a problem where you, know, you can just randomly deal and you know, it's just as good as anything else. So these are probably, we have probabilistic actions, we have deterministic actions. Um, as we started, we found this really problematic to describe in some of the existing planning languages that when we have these probabilistic um, actions, now, there's not a fixed distribution on the outcome that you can take the same action um, in almost the exact same state from, from one to another, and because you've now turned over one more card, that same action has a different distribution over your outcomes. And so, uh, yes, all planning problems explode exponentially as you, as you apply them, um, but we were exploding exponentially just in, in the description, and so we really kind of gave up and threw our hands in the air and said, well, we're not going to do that. Um, so, uh, where did we go? Uh, our first thought was, well, we have this great deterministic solver that we've used, that we've, we've improved significantly over something that was already there, so let's leverage that. Is, is there anything out there that, that we can use? And it turns out that um, in the planning community, there's an entire family of, of planning algorithms that actually depend on these deterministic solvers, and their determinization problems where they take a uh, probabilistic problem um, and fix all, the, all of these probabilistic um, the transitions beforehand, you turn it into a deterministic problem, and then you, you solve it um, using a probabilistic, um, using your deterministic solver. And hindsight optimization was the one um, that, we approached, that we were going to try in that. We also said, well, there's this um, whole other family of algorithms that's very successful, um, gaining steam over kind of in the reinforcement learning, machine learning community uh, called UCT. It's had incredible recent success in the, in the game of Go. If you look at the top computer performers for Go, like the top 15 or 20 are probably all based on UCT. Um, so really amazing, amazing. We said, well, well, we'll apply it. We really have a lot of confidence in our probable, in our deterministic solver. We think hindsight optimization is going to be the way to go, but we'll apply it anyways. Um, so how hindsight optimization works again, um, for each action that we consider from our root, we have to make a decision. We're going to. Um, for each action that we take, we're going to shuffle all the cards that we can't see, 
Um, we're going to fix them in that location, and we're going to see how often we can solve it. And then um, the one that the action that, that turns out to be the best is what we're going to take. So we have our, our game of Klondike Solitaire, and um, we're going to shuffle all the cards that you can't see. We're going to turn it into this uh, thoughtful solitaire problem, which we conveniently have a, um, a, a solver for. And so this is how this works. Um, pretty straightforward. You know, the idea here is that if, if we play the same action um, n times, if we play each action n times, and the deterministic solver can solve one action significantly more than the others, then we'll take that as an indication that um, probably that action is better off. So the, our initial results for um, hindsight optimization are very promising. So we, we far surpassed our Las Vegas standard. Um, human estimation, uh, we're well beyond that. We're incredibly pleased with these results. Um, I actually, when, when I started getting the results and saw as good as they were, I poured just tons and tons of jobs um, onto, onto our computers, onto our swarm that we have, um, so that I could um, drive down my error bars as low as possible. And, um, and so then we said, well, now that we have these great results, let's, um, let's kind of write up our straw man so that we can have something uh, to, to do with. And so we said, well, let's, you know, we're going to code up UCT. So UCT is a way of generating um, these forward look ahead trees optimistically. Um, you're go after you, you generate, uh, so you, you, you run these Monte Carlo trajectories to build a tree, and um, we're going to end up taking um, the highest average value. And I'll run through it. We're, we'll kind of go through this twice. Uh, first, to kind of see uh, kind of how the, the action of the tree is generated. And second, we'll look at some of the specifics. So um, one thing to keep in mind, um, just a side note, as we're talking about UCT, um, we have we, we kind of implemented this smart look ahead, that once all of our cards we're face up, we're no longer in a probabilistic, um, uh, we no longer have a probabilistic problem, we're completely deterministic. And so we said, well, if all of our, if we, get, if we reach a state where all our cards are face up, just kind of uh, look ahead really quickly, apply this uh, prioritized um, action um, policy that we have, see if we can solve it really quickly. And if we can, we count it as a win. Um, there's no reason not to do it, and it saves us time, so we figured we'd do it. And if you can't find a win using your smart look ahead, then you just go back to UCT policy. Um, so that's just kind of a side note to keep in mind, and we felt like that helped us a lot. Um, so UCT, what it's going to do is you start at the root, and you don't have you don't haven't done anything. You're just going to act randomly. You'll update your actions, um, run another one, update your actions, trajectory actions, and so you can see that as we run these trajectories, the actions are updated, um, and so forth and so on. So how does this actually work? So we have two values here on the left and the right. Uh, the Q value is a, a value where we're going to evaluate a state action pair. And the Q values, in this case for UCT, is just your average return. You take an action, um, if you've taken it 10 times, what's your average reward um, for, for taking that action? Now, the UCT value, this Q plus value here on the right, is it takes into account that value, the Q value. Um, and that's kind of, we're going to consider that um, kind of our exploitation value. And then it has this additional term on the right, which is our exploration value. And so this is going to cause us to want to explore actions that we haven't seen before, and we'll investigate how it happens. So from our root, we see that we haven't taken anything. We run this trajectory, and we have these values. And I conveniently um, notated that the, the value on the left that you see, 0 over 1, um, is our average return. We, we ran one trajectory, and we lost. So that's a 0. And then um, log 1 is 0, so you get a 0 on the right. Okay. You take this other. Now, as we, as we did that, I'll go back. Um, we're at the root, we've taken our action to the left, um, we look and we're in a state where we have not yet taken all the actions. So if you're in a state and you haven't yet taken all the actions, then you take an action that hasn't been taken yet. And we do that and we reach a state where we haven't reached before and so you act randomly. And now you have these values. Now once you're in a state, now once we've run this trajectory, we update all our values. And you notice this value on the left, we did not take that action. But that got updated because um, this log of n over s, n, n of s, is the number of times that your parent state has been visited. Um, and so we're going to take that. Um, and so when you take a trajectory, it affects not only the actions you take, but the children of the, all the nodes in the visit. And so um, it improves when we're in this state now from the root. Now that we've taken all the actions that are available to us, we'll just add these two values together, and um, we'll follow this optimistically. And so that's how UCT is, that's UCT in a nutshell. 
So here's UCTR results. Um, compared to hot, um, so we got 20, our, our hindsight optimization did 27%, and two of our ones here at UCT um, really did significantly better, which really surprised us and, and caused us to wonder, what is it about, what is it about UCT that makes it so much better than hot? Now, there's a, in, the, in the original hot paper, um, it makes a distinction between these two different kind of futures, correlated and um, independent futures. We'll talk about those a little bit. Correlated futures mean that if you, if you take correlated futures is almost essentially we're going to talk about dealing cards, shuffling all the cards at the top, okay, and then fixing them. And so whatever cards are there at the top have to be there. So if we take and follow this left action, uh, follow this left trajectory, and we, we, un we reveal the, a to, the ace of clubs in card, as card A, if we, if we follow another completely separate trajectory, and we say, well, we're going to do card B this time and reveal the ace of diamonds. If we choose to reveal card A, it has to be the ace of clubs. Why? Because we already revealed it once, and it was the ace of clubs already. Now, independent features, if we take those same set of actions, we first reveal the, a, the a, ace of clubs, and then we say, we're going to take a completely different trajectory. And we say, well, we reveal card B. And then if we say, reveal card A, card A is at liberty to be kind of whatever it wants. Because it's essentially like reshuffling the cards every time. And there's a known problem with hindsight optimization with correlated futures. It can reach into these states and think it's got a great idea. And once it gets there, it says, wait a second. When I was looking at this from back there, I knew where all the cards were. But now I have to guess. So it can reach problems. It can get into problems. And I talk about it in the paper. Here's a simple example where perfectly reasonable move will completely win the game. But if you're using hindsight optimization, you can reach a dead end. Um, where you should have won the game, but hindsight optimization will lose it for you. So, this is our idea of why hindsight optimization is outperforming these domains. And so we we're asking ourselves, well, how can we implement, can we, can we take our deterministic solver and integrate independent futures into it? And it really wasn't clear that the value function that we were using really needed to know where those were. And so we said, instead, can we develop a variant of UCT um, that will use this hot principle? And so we kind of have these UT cheat trees that are really big and let, let the, the actions expand out, uh, the branching factor, the action expand out as much as they want. And so we said, well, let's take these UCT trees and instead of letting them expand out, we'll just determinize them so that if ever you're in a state and an action and you transition to a new state from that state action pair, the next time you reach that state and take that action, you're forced to take, you're forced to go to the same state that you reached the first time. And so this is kind of our idea of hop, is that now we're going to have a much skinnier tree. We can make up for this in the same way that they do with hop by generating a whole bunch of them. And so while the variance on each one of these trees individually will be quite high, when you take the average of the action values over those, um, it'll make up for it. And this is our result. We have um, two of our um, results from UCT and hop UCT. That's just as well. The interesting result is on these bottom two, um, we're both using 2,000 trajectories to make our decision. Um, in UCT, we're pouring all 2,000 trajectories into one tree. And on the other one, we're pouring in, um, we're having 20 different trees, each with 100 trajectories, and uh, we cut our time um, almost in fours. And so kind of two interesting things come from this, is that the tree size uh, largely determines the speed of each trajectory. As you grow these trees a lot wider, you have to do more calculations. And so it costs more to, do these tr to, do, to run trajectories on large trees. Um, but we can make up for that because um, by reducing the variance, by averaging a number of trees, we can increase our accuracy um, through the, the ensemble. And so we kind of, in addition to this, we say, well, we have big fat trees, we have skinny trees, kind of what's here in the middle? And we realize that we can um, kind of control how much time we spend in each tree and our accuracy um, with these sparse branches and um, the number and our ensembling our trees. And so we kind of have this entire family and um, we show some nice properties about the sparse trees um, in the paper. Um, and so here's a kind of a visual representation of this family of algorithms that we're talking about. We have ensemble sparse UCT, sparse UCT, and the whole thing. We kind of the best results that we get, um, one of our runs of ensemble UCT with 200 trajectories per tree and 20 trees per decision, um, even with the 99% um, confidence intervals above. Um, 35%. So kind of our conclusions, far, far beyond um, Las Vegas standards, um, UCT variants outperform the hop, far beyond human performance. Performance increases, you know, we can, we can 
control our performance and our speed based on these three different factors that we have. Um, cost of each trajectory increases, as we said before, with the size of the tree. And we showed some nice theoretical properties for sparse CCT. Um, and still we're solving fewer than half of the number of games that we know have solutions. Um, where we'd like to go in the future, um, we've really only touched the surface. We have not fully explored um, kind of this family of, of, of UCT variants. Um, where is the, where's the right balance? Probably end up being um, domain dependent, but just kind of being able to explore a little bit further of how, where is this trade-off uh, between these three variables. Expanding to other domains, um, and then um, we'd like to really implement learning. Um, UCT currently, um, just as we explained, explores completely randomly when it, when it visits an, an action, a state in action that has been sampled. And it seems completely reasonable to, to learn a default policy, uh, probably offline, um, and then use that, uh, use that heuristic instead of random. And we actually have some uh, experiments right now that are running, um, that are winning over 40% of games based on some of the default policies that we're running. Um, Sponsor in 2010, right? Because so Las Vegas can be closed, right? They're out of money. <laughs> What's going on? Well, I, I don't think they. Well, I hope yeah. that half of your machines are now not working on default policy generation, but on emptying Las Vegas bank accounts. That would be very nice. I, would, I think that would be great. But the, the, but but um, if you notice the slides, it takes even a computer um, sometimes a few hours to, to run each of these games. Which, uh, it means in all likelihood, none of the policies that we're, um, we're using, that we are using currently to win these games, uh, are probably anywhere near human understanding. Uh, there's no way a human can take this to Vegas as much as I would love to. Even if they, even if Vegas, all indications are that Vegas doesn't do this any longer. Also, in Vegas, it must be, it's only for human allowed to play, right? Yes. <laughs> when it was played, it was only allowed for humans to do Sorry. I doubt they let your, you hook up your computer to the game, even if it was a computer game. I doubt they let you plug in your USB port. I see, I see. I okay, you will not be able to Okay. Rob? Rob? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to add my wall to uh, Padma's wall. And they gave me another question. Uh, which is the UCT variants, did you wind up using the uh, deterministic solver at all? No. So that seems like a pretty obvious thing to try and do, right? I mean, just because you need uh, kind of well, at, what point, at what point in the algorithm use the deterministic solver? Is my question. What I mean, you are using it in the half original half version. You are using yes. the thoughtful solitaire deterministic solver, right? So yes, if in you half. you put, I mean, in the FF half thing that we actually considered in the. In the probabilistic planning kind of optimization paper, we considered looking at independent futures too. And the question is, it's not clear to me that you can't use the solver. Well, the, the problem with the solver, that the solver, the, the, this hand to value function that we have, um, but most of the features are, are all like, is one card like, it's a really bad, you're in a bad state if like you have um, a jack of spades on top of your queen of hearts and your queen of diamonds, right? You're in a world of hurt. Okay? Okay. If that queen of diamonds and the queen of hearts is face down underneath your jack of spades, okay? you're, you're never, you, how are you gonna get that jack down? Okay, I mean, it's possible, but you have to be able to know what those face down cards are, and to do that, you have to fix at the top. It has to be correlated futures. Okay. And so, so, I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying that not with the, not with the deterministic solver we that you have. I think, so if you want to use, I guess if you want to use this for normal probabilistic planning benchmarks, right. it may well be possible that you could use uh, like a deterministic planner over the independent so Certainly, and, and in, this, in, this, like, uh, in this final slide that we had, where we're, we've learned a, a new policy, we've learned this new default policy, and what that ends up being is a similar type of thing that doesn't depend on seeing uh, these face down cards. I can count, I actually count and say, well, what cards are face down? Um, and count those against me. 
and I count, and I learn weights for each of the individual cards, and I do all kinds of things that I could think of without actually knowing where these cards are. And so that's kind of a similar type of thing. Oh, thank you. Yeah.